Good evening, everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you all for coming and a welcome to this Arboricultural Association Wednesday webinar. My name's John Parker. I'm Chief Exec at the Arboricultural Association and your host for this evening. Hope you're all well. Uh, please say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. Select everyone as you do so. Uh, we've had a very strong international representation in the last few weeks. So let's see if we can get all uh, all of the continents, but no fibbing, we can check. So all you people who are now gonna say you're in Antarctica, we will look to see if you're there or not. Um, if you've got any questions for our speaker tonight, then please do uh, put them in the Q&A button uh, and we'll work through as many as we can at the end. Our next webinar, uh, after tonight is not next week it's the week after that's going to be our bats and trees bats versus trees spectacular on april the 20th that's in partnership with the bat conservation trust there'll be a series of experts facing off against each other to make the case for why their side bats or trees is best and you'll have the chance to vote for your favorite so it should be a fun evening hope we'll see you there that's wednesday april the 20th 6 p.m and the link to register for that one is in the chat, I believe. This evening, we're very pleased to welcome Camilla Allen, landscape architect, environmental historian, and the author of a brand new book, The Politics of Street Trees. This is right up my street, but I'm very much looking forward to this, very excited. Uh, put all your questions in the Q&A panel. We will uh, go through them at the end, but there's one little warning tonight. This evening at 7.30, I will be giving a presentation to the Stonehouse Gardening Club. Yes, you heard me right. The Stonehouse Gardening Club. It's the hottest ticket in town. It's 7.30, which means I need to leave here at about 20 past at the latest. So that's why if I cut short your questions, that's why. But don't worry, your loss will be Stonehouse Gardening Club's gain. So fear not. Um, but it's not the hottest ticket in town, obviously, because that is this evening with Camilla. So I'm very pleased to hand over now to our speaker. Camilla, it's over to you. Thank you very much, John. Hi. Um, so, um, good evening, and thank you for joining me tonight um, for a session on our recently published book, The Politics of Street Trees. And sadly, I cannot claim to be the sole author. Um, it's a big book um, with multiple contributors. Um, but I hope that I'll be able over the course of the next 50 minutes or so to communicate what I think is important and timely about it as a volume. So the politics of street trees, um, it's been edited by Jan Wadstra and myself. It was published in March by Routledge. And I'm going to hopefully I'll remember to do this little plug again at the end. But it's currently um, it's available as a hardback and as a paperback on the Routledge website. It's currently discounted and I've got a further 20% off. So if you're interested in that, then keep an eye on the chat because I think I'm going to be posting that just to make sure that everyone can get hold of it. Um, the book itself is one, so we've got a couple of really wonderful endorsements. One from Tom Williamson, who is a professor of landscape history at the University of East Anglia who described it as deftly weaving together narratives of politics and landscape, bringing a fresh international perspective to the complex and contested subject of urban trees. Um, something that was developed upon by Tenley Conway, who said it's essential reading for anyone interested in urban nature or the politics of urban spaces. And I'm pretty sure that I think for everyone who's in attendance here, your working lives are defined by the politics of urban spaces. So I do hope that there's something in this for you. Um, the book emerged from a conference that we held in Sheffield in 2019 called Street Trees and Politics. Um, it invited interdisciplinary contributions from academics in Sheffield and beyond, um, catalyzed in part by the crisis that had unfolded in the city in the years before, but also to bring a historical perspective and an international perspective to that. Uh, as a book, it has 28 chapters from around 40 contributors. So um, there is, I'd like to think, something for everyone in it. Um, and we were very lucky to have um, David Blunkett, who is a Labour politician who was born, born and raised in Sheffield and is now the Baron of Brightside and Hillsborough, uh, who wrote the foreword for the book. And I thought I'd just start by 
I'm just reading out that short passage. Ironic that there should have been a row about felling of trees in the city that is renowned for its open spaces, its woodland and its greenery, with a third of the city itself in the Peak District National Park and with every claim to having more trees than any other urban conurbation in Europe. A combination of outsourced renewal and renovation of roads and pavements, a stubborn bureaucracy and poor statescraft led to a politically damaging outcome, but lessons to be learned and acted on for the future. And so what I'll be talking about tonight is not really what happened in Sheffield, but more actually how that spirit of understanding what lessons need to be learnt and how it is that we might act upon them. That's what we did. I'm sorry, I've also got a, got a cat sat on my knee. <laughs> and he's protested about that, that slide. Anyway, um, this issue has, um, despite the street trees for or kind of abating a little in recent years, it's actually, it has returned to focus with the release of a film called The Felling. So it's a film by Jackie Bellamy and Eve Wood, which presents itself as an epic tale of people power and which I went to see a couple of weeks ago at Sheffield City Hall. And the premiere had 800 people in attendance and it, you know, it pro proved to be an extraordinarily compelling and distressing and interesting film. But, and well, yeah, I would say very much well worth watching. It now has a cinematic release. Um, but I was struck, you know, there were very few politicians and very few councillors and actually very few people who dis dissented from the, you know, trees are universally good and well-loved uh, narrative. And that really was one of the aspects that has motivated the book is to try and understand what nuance could be found in the issue um, and to really get to the heart of it as far as it's possible. Because very much, this isn't just an issue for Sheffield. Um, I mean, as you will all know, um, just in the UK alone, the impact of HS2 and its construction on both the ancient woodlands that have been affected by its route, but also the street trees around Euston, a place where I used to work in London a few a well, long while ago now. Um, all of which, you know, vulnerable to that pro. Um, the development of that train. And alongside the wider, the wider issues beyond Sheffield, there are other things which make the publication of this book sort of dwarf into insignificance. And actually my, much of my excitement, I'm sort of, I've not edited a book before. So um, when we were receiving our copies in March, I had been looking forward to it, but actually much of my excitement really was tampered by recent events, you know, the war in Ukraine, the cost of living crisis, and the IPCC's report on climate change, all of which made the achievement of editing the book pale into insignificance. However, when I saw this image, and this, this is one just was in The Guardian um, this weekend of uh, a woman walking along the street, um, you know, these destroyed Russian tanks in Bucha. Um, I was really struck that actually there are street trees in this picture and they're blackened and they're damaged, but they are still standing. And that actually, that changed my feeling about, you know, the timeliness of this book, because actually it has a really significant and important contribution to make. Um, across the, the 28 chapters that are outlined shortly, um, there are plenty of themes that address um, both war and the austerity and climate change, um, the impact of policies of the politics of war on our towns and cities, the planting and care of, tre of trees to ameliorate during and after conflict, the insidious effect of austerity and the necessity of seeing street trees as solution multipliers, as allies, as we make our homes and our streets and our neighbourhoods more resilient to a changing climate. So I think on those fronts and more, um, I'd like to think that the politics of street trees makes a contribution. And it's these layers of meaning 
that we've been trying to unravel. This is a Yoshino cherry planted in 1929 on Abbeydale Park Rise in Sheffield. It's one of the trees that, I don't know, some might say is, is quite mature now. <laughs> it's got a, um, but still bringing a sort of an annual transient beauty. Um, what we would love is that for anyone who reads our book is all the more enlightened as to all of the different dimensions of nationalism, of hope and of optimism that are bound up just with this one tree species alone. Enough preamble. Um, so in this talk, I'm not going to cover the whole book, um, not least because it's just me and I can't do justice to it. Um, the diversity of voices and the diversity of contributions. Um, I'm going to make a short summary of the key perspectives and approaches in the book. And then I'm going to describe in a bit more detail the impetus and focus of the chapter that I wrote for the book, which was on Sheffield's commemorative street trees. And I'm going to close with something that we've not really shared with anyone yet. And actually, this is one of the really exciting points about this book being out in the world. Um, something we titled the conclusion towards an inclusive charter for street trees. And actually, I can't think of a better audience um, to share that with for the first time. So I'll be really interested to know what you think about that. Um, it's 12 points, but yeah, so do, uh, do bear with me. Um, both the conference and the book were underpinned by the following questions. Um, firstly, how have street trees been used to support political narratives? Who plants and owns them? And what are the debates and narratives on responsibility, both historically and at present? How has a case for street trees been argued in the past and at present? And how has that been translated into policy? So very much trying to understand all of the things that are often invisible, those layers of meaning, the layers of intention that are bound up with the planting of a tree. And further questions, um, what are the environmental and political issues in relation to the design of street trees, where they are planted and how? And lastly, how is it possible that in a period where climate warming is one of the major issues affecting the survival of humanity, that street trees are not considered as a vital part of the urban ecosystem and thus integrated into the political debate? This is one of the things that um, was most striking about what happened in Sheffield is actually seeing firsthand the, the consequences of an under, you know, the growing understanding within the general public that trees have a vital part to play. So when they're being cut down, it seems to fly in the face of that. The logic is, the logic is unclear um, and all, again, nuance easily lost. We, so the, answer, the questions that I've just posed are not ones that I'm going to answer point by point, but they are answered across the volume. Um, I'm just going to go through the different chapters just because I think what I wanted to highlight is that there are there is extreme, extraordinary variety. Um, starting with a chapter written by um, my co-editor, Jan Wadstra, on the right to plant, which was um, a law implemented in the Netherlands um, around the time that's this image actually um, by Herman Staflin, um, a law called Putrecht, which basically asked landowners, people who own property adjacent to roads to plant trees, the responsibility that they had and then the impact that that had on people like John Evelyn, who traveled to the Netherlands in that period and were completely sold on what they had seen. Um, that's then developed by Felicity Stout, who uh, looked further into the work of Evelyn and others um, with a chapter, Trees Even in Their Very Roads, so mid 17th century English perspective on trees, streets and policies. And which very interestingly, so looking at people, figures like Samuel Hartlib, um, positioned it within the, alongside the English Civil War and the sort of millenarian thought that was very, very prominent at the time. Um, all these utopians and their trees. 
that's then um, really, I think, quite powerfully given a counterpoint by Fanola O'Kane, who's an Irish academic and architectural historian who's written about the trees in the Ulster plantations, the green lines of power, and their role in repurposed military landscapes. And going from this more chapters that look at the sort of policy and philosophy to something maybe more uh, aligned with early ideas of self-sufficiency. So um, Sylvia Butchenshone and Thomas Thranet who have contributed a chapter on the planting of roadside fruit trees in German regions in the 18th and 19th centuries. And I think as we head towards many probably much more keen debates about food security, the role of trees in that I think is never to be underestimated and has, as yeah, many of these chapters demonstrate, a very historical dimension. Um, Paul Elliott, um, who may be known to some of you, has written about class tensions and social change in Victorian and Edwardian towns, and um, the role that trees played in that sylvan strife. And we continued with, um, so those for the most part, the European perspectives. Um, Lara Roman and Theodore Eisenman have written about the drivers of street tree selection in um, Philadelphia and the case of London plane trees, why they were so particularly identified as a, as a perfect shade tree. Um, and then moving on to India, the chapter from Gert Groening, who's a German academic landscape and garden historian, who examined the life and legacy of Gustav Hermann Krumbeigel who was a German horticulturalist trained at Kew, who spent most of his working life in India, in the Southern States, and who in that um, demonstrated an extraordinary legacy as a silent activist as Patrice, someone again who put the promotion of productive and um, beautiful trees as at the kind of heart of what he was trying to do in these different cities. Um, there's my chapter, which I'll speak uh, in greater depth about in a minute. Um, and then another more international perspective from Yishi Liu and Yan on roads of, uh, of modernisation, the way in which Western approaches to tree planting influenced China um, between 1911 and 1949. And then um, we're not, I know we're not supposed to have favourites, um, but... Um, Viva Kitat's uh, chapter on Japanese cherry pride on foreign ground, I think is one that I would recommend anyone who has even the most fleeting interest in cherry trees read because you'll never be able to look at them in quite the same light after. He manages to bring together so much of the, of the history and culture and significance of those trees beyond just their, beyond just their aesthetics. Um, the second part, of the book looks at street tree values um, and policy and management. And that's something we first introduced in the, uh, the historical dimension of. So um, looking at highway tree policies and management um, very much in terms of ownership and responsibility. Um, then Ross Cameron, who's another academic in the Department of Landscape Architecture, um, posed the fantastically um, <laughs> contrarian question, street trees matter. So what's the matter with street trees, which um, explores how the ecosystem, both services and disservices of street trees can and should influence attitudes. Um, street trees in compact cities, so you know, changing urban form and how that's going to affect species selection and health and longevity. It's explored by Kai Wang, Jiang Hang and Julian Hunt. Um, and then the tone rather changes with Alan Simpson's chapter, um, which makes, I think, the very important statement that um, the opportunity to interact with the urban forest is a human right, um, with street trees being the most accessible and compelling part of that urban forest. And another chapter, I think the, the, the variety of this section, I think is one I'm particularly proud of, um, John Miller, who's a, a academic from the School of English, looked at what street trees mean and examined it from the perspective of memory and of beauty and hospitality, emphasising the intangible 
in opposition to the way in which often neoliberal economics have rather shifted the sense of how it is we might value trees and nature more widely. We continued the more, um, yeah, the international scope um, with a chapter that really highlights actually many, many of the challenges that will come in the future. A chapter looking at the impact of climate change and forest fires on the evolving street tree policies in Portugal and in Porto in particular, um, Claudia Fernandes, Catarina Texera and Isabel Martino da Silva, um, looking at the domino effect of a warming climate and forest fires, which I think uh, is something that there are many, many lessons to be learned there. Um, we had a shift to uh, two chapters that look more at the economics of trees, um, the political economy of street trees. This is a chapter from John Hennebury and Philip Catney, which traces this paradigm shift from a kind of Keynesian corporatism to, again, this neoliberal politics and economics and how that's affected trees, um, which is then really pleasingly complemented by Philip Wyman's, which looks at the economics of street trees, but um, with a further exploration in actually how they relate to the economics of happiness. So something I think for in terms of complexity of, um, yeah, I've learned a lot about economics <laughs> as a result of editing this book. Maybe that's the time to say that. Um, yeah, and also written about roadside trees and traffic safety policies. And Nicola Dempsey, which I think she might have the prize for pretty much the best title in the book. It's almost meatloaf, but not quite. Streets Ahead or the Road to Hell, analysing street tree strategies in the UK, which um, it's a very interesting way of tracing how street tree strategies have evolved both during and after what happened in Sheffield and actually using that record as a means of holding these, these things to account and understanding um, much of the much of the subtlety of actually create, you know, identifying meaning from goals. And then um, we move on to contribution from Charles Miners. Um, so the legal responsibility for street trees, how the law applies on highway land and land adjacent to it. A chapter from Sonia Dumpelman, uh, street trees seen through the lens of the Cold War and the division of Germany occupying public space and generating public spheres. So very much how trees became a focus of um, street tree art and activism in Germany. And then with a chapter from Charlie Shackleton, looking at the legacy of colonial and apartheid eras on the distribution, contribution and representation of street trees in South Africa. Um, very much a focus on, you know, how it, things as like species selection and are reflective of entrenched inequalities. Again, with the core um, mention of how the lack of productive tree species actually is also part of a, a you know, a really a necessary rethink of how we think about street trees. Um, Herman Tovar Corzo and Sylvie Nail um, had created a very interesting exploration of what has been happening in Bogota, Colombia which is a city that's often held up as um, being a showcase for urban forestry, but actually which I think struggles with a lot of um, political alignment over the issue and indifference from local authorities and often um, built infrastructure being given priority over green. And all of which I think then is um, interestingly complemented by um, the latter. Uh, latter few chapters in that section. So the legal protection of street trees in Israel, a uh, chapter by Yifa Holzman Gazette, who walked out of her house one day to find that two trees had been cut down. Um, and that shift, she was an uh, academic specialising in property law, but then he was able to shift her attentions to the Israeli policy on trees and actually how extraordinary it was that across over five years, 375,000 street trees um, were cut down across Israel. Um, two Sheffield academics, um, Ian Rotherham and Matthew Flinders, traced the socio-political dynamics of street tree contestation um, through the Sheffield case study. So that's one of the chapters where there's more focus on what happened in Sheffield 
um, making the case for a more detached analysis of the drivers of concern and resistance in civic society. So very much positioning it as um, part of a wider politics um, and wider issues of concern. And then Fionn Stevenson, who's a architect and academic, and but who in this context very much uh, writes as an activist as well as an academic, looking at uh, sight lines as fight lines, tree, house, street. So how the street tree protest galvanised her to protest in Sheffield um, and what the methods were that they used. And then last but not least, uh, Russell Horsey, who I'm sure is known to many of you, um, has written a fantastic chapter to close the book why green practitioners need to learn more about engineering and get political, um, making the case that the importance of trees is often drowned out by more powerful lobbying bodies um, and how it is that we can maybe affect change in the political system. So I hope that that's whetted your appetite. Um, it's just a very short summary, but um, like I said, these are all um, chapters that we've edited to ensure that actually they're as, as readable as, you know, this is this is a, it's an academic book, but actually it's, it's readability, it's accessibility was a really important motivating force in putting it together. Um, so I do hope that that has um, inspired you to maybe um, order a copy. Um, and now what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit more about the chapter that I wrote. Um, this um, draws and develops upon a research interest that I have in general. Um, my PhD was on a man called Richard St. Barb Baker, who was known as the man of the trees. And as a result of that, I've become very interested in how we preserve and protect trees and actually how what can be learned anytime we really investigate and try and understand the motivations behind the protection and planting of trees. And my personal experience of the Sheffield street tree crisis was one of, of feeling quite sort of powerless for the most part. I was doing my PhD and um, yet yeah, not really able to contribute very much. Um, one of the things that I found most affecting was what was happening with the um, a number of commemorative avenues in Sheffield, which were one of which I think most famously was cited for the felling. Um, so this was in December 2017, the councillors and Sheffield's council voted on a motion to um, whether or not to spend half a million pounds, £500,000 on restoring the trees on Western Road. And it was decided at that point that that was too great a price um, and that that money instead could be spent on social care, which I think was a very difficult and very divisive um, dilemma to put to the people of Sheffield. It really was one of the really more polarizing parts of it. Um, the iconography of this particular part of the street tree protests was very powerful. I mean, this the photo here was um, of a historical reenactment in which people dressed up as First World War soldiers and marched from the station to the city hall and to these trees and had a moment's silence, all of which you know, deeply emotive, I think not least because this was taking place around the time of the centenary of the end of the First World War. It was something also that was made all the more challenging because emotions were running understandably very high, um, the parades and vigils and the language reflected the strength of feeling. Um, one paper, one national newspaper, implored the council to rethink plans to cut down trees that have been planted to remember the victims of the war. You know, the, the you know, these aren't, they weren't servicemen and soldiers, they're victims. And it appeared, I think, that um, to more than, or to many people, that a covenant between the local authority and the people had been broken, and one that had been forged during the sacrifices of the First World War, um, and which the council was, at that point, not able to uphold. Yet at the same time, there was plenty of constructive action taking place in Sheffield. Um, but it was this, it was this notice that went up on the um, gates of my local park, which I think gave me my in, as, as you might say. 
um, War Memorial Avenue tree planting proposal at Mearsbrook Park. Um, it's a very straightforward proposal, like two avenues, but um, motivated in part because the street trees represented a really challenging memorial for the local authority to look after. Um, trees which were more vulnerable um, you know, to compaction, to damage, um, to vandalism. And that actually maybe if with the council being the holders of that memory, that it would be important for them to think about how better to do it in perpetuity. Um, but it also, as I think as a landscape architect, made me curious about how we might move meaning. If we're planting trees that are, or replanting trees, can we also replant that meaning? And really what was the original intention at the time that the trees were planted? Um, this image here is um, more what we have in mind when we think about trees and memorials. So um, this is an image um, from a booklet produced after the First World War, which was influencing the way people were thinking about the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Um, the image is titled A War Cemetery with Permanent Memorials as Designed. Um, and I think in this I'm very curious about how it is that we imbue trees uh, with meaning and how we shape that meaning through a consideration of species selection, through their spatial arrangement, um, and not least actually how that relates to their long-term maintenance, their possible death and their replacement. And I think in in high contrast um, is this image of one of the trees um, and one of the trees with its re-commemorative um, laminated memorial. Um, for me, one of the things I found most intriguing about these street trees as a memorial is that they were pretty much illegible. The, the trees, some of the trees had, um, some of the streets had plaques that nominated them or, or clearly sort of described them as having a commemorative purpose. But many of the trees were looked much the same as any other street tree. Um, very different to a statue or an obelisk or a stained glass window. Um, and so one of the things that I most wanted to understand is um, if we couldn't read the trees themselves, what else could we read to understand what had happened? And for me, it was actually as someone who's only been in Sheffield for um, a few years, 10 years. I mean, it's not, it's not the city I was born in, but one that I'm coming to understand. Um, one of the most important things was to understand the impact of the song um, on the planting of these trees. So in Sheffield in 1914, um, as with many of the industrial cities of Northern England, um, a huge number of men volunteered for service. Um, the city battalion known as the Sheffield Pals, who were formerly part of the York and Lancaster Regiment were an extraordinarily visible um, and very, I think, very potent symbol of Sheffield's contribution to the war effort. Um, this is a picture of the volunteers in their, you know, in their civvies, as it was, standing outside outside Sheffield Midland train station. Um, there's a fascinating book called, um, oh no, it was named, totally forgot, it's totally escaped me <laughs> in this moment in time, um, which describe fictionalises um, their story in which, for me, really tied up this, it's called Covenant with Death, um, uh, and which really brings to life actually what was happening in Sheffield at that time for, for the men and for the women who were bound up in the First World War. The story of their sort of wider occupation of the city is fascinating. Um, not least, you know, they were trained in and around Sheffield, but, you know, as the troops were being mobilised, there was in no way the infrastructure or sort of apparatus for training them. So this is the city battalion building a road, I think probably near Red Myers Reservoir. And there are still traces of the trenches that they dug up on the moors. But this battalion of a thousand men um, were positioned on the Somme. And within a day, um, one devastating battle, their number or well, battalion of thousand men was reduced by half. Um, death, injury, and men whose bodies were never recovered. 
um, with the regiments reforming, but I think the impact on Sheffield and on the people of Sheffield, the, you know, the absolute hollowing out of a whole generation of young men was something that really the city didn't quite recover from. Whilst at the same time, another extraordinary sacrifice was being made um, with the industrialization of an already industrial city, um, move into munitions, manufacture, and uh, women joining the workforce just for, you know, for three points. And for me, this was partly the way in which I was able to get under the skin of what these commemorative avenues meant. Um, the one planted at Western Road, I've come to the conclusion, is um, it's there is a war memorial inside the church, but the trees themselves are something they were planted to commemorate the sacrifice made by pupils much more broadly. And I thought that that was quite an important thing to note. It wasn't just those who'd served in the armed forces, but all students who had made a contribution. Um, in comparison, the trees on Oxford Street, this is a, a little closer to the city centre, um, a different demographic actually of area, but alongside another school, these were trees that were much more, much more definitively planted to commemorate individuals who were lost. Um, they were planted in 1917, the year after the Battle of the Somme. And for me, they represent an extraordinarily um, swift and um, effective form of commemoration compared to a lot of the debates that actually took place in Sheffield um, around what were appropriate forms of memorialization. These were trees planted in memory of the boys who'd been lost at the school. You can just see the outline of the school's roof in the centre of the picture, um, who would have been known to their teachers and to the community. And for me, what um, in terms of the, uh, the sources that I was drawing upon, one of the things I found most compelling in telling the story of, or in, in understanding and then retelling the story of what had shaped the debate around tree planting as a form of memorial and a form of commemoration during the First World War um, was a letter written in 1919. And this really helped me reframe what this whole idea of a living memorial was. Because actually when in 2018 uh, people were talking about living memorials, it was the trees that were living memorials. Um, during the First World War, actually, a living memorial was something of utility. So it could have been a bus shelter or a village hall or a playing field, things that would be used by people. But this letter, I thought, was um, something that made the difficult decision that the councillors in Sheffield felt that they were making. I think it brought it into quite stark contrast. So with so many living war memorials round about us, would it not be the most fitting to devote what funds we can towards helping the widows and orphans of those who have made the supreme sacrifice, and especially our poor blinded heroes and the crippled and maimed? Surely these are our living war memorials, and surely they are worthy of the very best that lies in our power to do for them. Not a charity, but as a duty for the great sacrifices on our behalf. Let the stained glass windows and crosses, obelisks, etc. wait, at least for a while. And so um, this is uh, some of the trees that were planted in Sheffield, a picture I took in, um, it's on Oxford Street, I took in July last year. Um, the laminated signs have come down. Um, it appears again as a pretty ordinary street in quite an ordinary part of Sheffield. But I think still these trees remain as representative of a covenant between the local authority and its community. And for me, I think what's most important is it reinforces the importance of the renewal of that covenant, much as we commemorate the war. Um, it's actually commemorating the wider sacrifice and the wider significance of these events on our life. Now, I can't quite believe it's 6.41. I'm going to race through this last little bit. Um, 
Now, um, I'd just like to close with what we have created in, a, in an, an inclusive charter for street trees. So I'm just going to go through the 12 points. Um, and like I said, I'd be really very interested to know what you think of this. Um, the first point is that we acknowledge the importance of our connection with trees. So street trees are for many people the nearest form of nature. They are also evidence of cultural practices and exemplify nature culture, connecting nature and trees by excellence. I'm sure that you will all agree with that one. Um, we need to recognise their contribution to environmental quality. Highway trees improve the environmental quality of urban and rural environments. They help to promote human health and well-being. Therefore, tree cover should be enhanced wherever possible. We should acknowledge diverse values, understanding all of the various values of trees, be them cultural, historical, psychological, natural, environmental, aesthetic, personal, etc., is an important part of the process of acknowledging their contribution. Number four, building towards environmental resilience. Street trees can help cushion the consequences of climate change and they are therefore a part of sustainable futures. Number five, enriching education. Street trees should be integrated in environmental education from primary school to higher education in order to enhance a general understanding of green infrastructure at base level, as well as more, tech, more specific technical knowledge within further education and new civics of the environment that builds literacy in the widest sense of the world. Although I think a primary school child might find the politics of street trees a bit of a, a, bit of a mouthful. Um, promoting interdisciplinary academic research. Um, interdisciplinarity research. Interdisciplinary research should be promoted. It is the linchpin for understanding the contribution street trees make to physical and psychological well-being. Number seven, building community. Knowledge building and promoting an understanding of the values of street trees is vital in order to create resilient and vibrant communities, as well as strengthening and supporting the individuals and organizations who are already making this happen. Number eight, investing in people as well as trees. The skill and knowledge of those working and volunteering in the private, public and the third sector should be properly acknowledged and celebrated. Number nine, planning holistically. Whole system approaches should be adapted in the planning and planting of street trees, ensuring that the maximum number of benefits can be achieved. They should be planted by those fully versatile in both cultural and natural values. Number 10, promoting ecological connectivity. Lines and avenues of street trees can provide opportunities to create links within ecological frameworks. And as a consequence, they should be promoted on both a local and national level. Number 11, almost there. Replacing those that have disappeared. Street trees that are lost through disease or accidents should be replaced. Existing trees should be maintained as the contribution of trees to their environment generally increases with age. And last but not least, investing in management and maintenance. Trees as well as their surrounding areas should receive high quality attention from those who are responsible for them so as to ensure the delivery of the points above. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I was going to read a little bit more, but I think I'll stop there because otherwise it gets a little bit reedy. Um, and I noticed that there are questions in the chat. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, hopefully we'll be able to repost the details of the book in the chat. Um, in the meantime, if you'd like to, this my contact details on this email. I think I'm on LinkedIn as well, but um, it'd be very nice to continue this conversation. I'm a 
a bit giddy about this book coming out. I think there are lots of, I think, hopefully it will resonate, I think not least with um, those of you who are here tonight. And I would be very, very interested to know what you, what you think of it. Anyway, so thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Camilla. Fantastic stuff. Um, yes, lots of excitement in the chat. Lots of people are going to be going to get the book, I believe, and quite right too. Um, okay, we've got quite a few questions in. If you've got any more questions, keep them coming. What have we got? We've got about half an hour. We're good. Uh, so I was good. one thing I'll ask you, you did cover it a little bit, but uh, Chris has asked about, could you possibly give a potted history of the Sheffield Street Tree episode, which is a difficult ask, I know, um, and very emotive. And I'm sure there's some people who are on the webinar who are very emotive about it. But for those who weren't familiar, and we've got a big international audience, do you just give a sort of summary of what happened? So, um, where do we begin? So, Sheffield as a city um, had very, very bad roads about 10 years ago. We'll start with roads. Um, and the desire was that the roads in Sheffield would be resurfaced. But one of the consequences of the cuts to local budgets was that the council didn't actually have the money to resurface the roads. And so through a number of different political mechanisms, it was first arranged by the then incumbent Liberal Democrat Council, and then later the Labour Council, under the sort of auspices of the sort of wider national government, that Sheffield's roads would be resurfaced through what was called a, a PFI deal, a private financing initiative, um, which would cost 25 billion, no, many billions of pounds over 25 years, and a contractor called Amy were signed up to do that work and that was meant to result in Sheffield no longer being Pothole City but within a short while it became quite clear that a number of street trees were being felled in bits of the city and actually I think one of the bits that is quite an important part of the story is that in Sheffield is a Sheffield is a city with uh, quite a uh, what's the word, best way of describing this? Parts, some parts of the city are relatively affluent and some parts not. And it's very geographical. There's very, um, there's a wealthy uh, southwest and a much less wealthy north and east. And a lot of trees were felled in the north and east. But then when trees started to be felled that were apparently healthy in other parts of the city, um, very quickly, a very, very, well-organised and focused campaign emerged in Sheffield, which tried to counter what was happening. So um, the contractor, Amy, and the local authority were, they were the ones who were most sort of in the firing line for what was going on. The council doubled down. They said that all of the trees had been inspected, that they were, any tree that was going to be felled was dead, diseased, dying, discriminatory or diseased. I covered that. Got my five Ds. Damaging. Damaging. Sorry, damaging the pavement. Um, and that was seen as being actually untrue by a lot of the campaigners. So there was the beginning of what was a. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's quite interesting seeing that what's in the chat already. Um, so the, I think one of the things that was very particularly powerful is a lot of people who, and I think going back to my point earlier about, you know, we have these prevailing messages about how important, how important trees are and how important they are in fighting climate change. To have a council that seemed to be willfully cutting down healthy trees made people very angry. And so there were extensive protests, um, which as they escalated over a number of years resulted in some very, very unpleasant clashes between protesters and the police. There was the Rustlings Road incident where um, the council co-opted the police to go and knock on people's doors at about five in the morning and remove their cars and then cut the trees down in the dark and you know and so you know it's pretty 
I'm not going to do this justice really at all, but um, it was pretty messy. Maybe we'll just say it got very messy. At the same time, some very important things were happening. There was lots of really quite powerful advocacy. There were lots of people who had really constructive things they wanted to say, kind of making those points. Um, one of the reasons I find the Western Road Tree so interesting is because that was quite a different part of the campaign. The Sheffield Trees Action Group was one as a kind of umbrella organisation, but even within that, there were different different issues and different approaches in different places. And so one of the things over the course of a number of people being arrested and lots of freedom of information requests and there being an increasing kind of um, increasing evidence that the that the contract was not all that the council was making out for and that possibly it was more punitive and more restrictive on the local authority again who had you know suffered on they didn't have a lot of money <laughs> Um, I think this was it's turned into a nightmare for a lot of people who were involved in the quite very small, um, small and very sort of top heavy council structure at that time. So all of the freedom of information requests that were being put in and court cases and so forth, I think ultimately revealed that the contract was yeah, the contract was punitive and many of the trees that were due to be felled were no longer sort of quite so at risk and the positives that came out of it was there was a well positives I mean the things that came out of it were um there was a referendum so there's been a political change in Sheffield as a result of this um it was a campaign called It's Our City and it shifted what was a few years ago a strong leader model so um the Labour councillors had a majority therefore they held all of the significant posts on the council and now we have a um committee model instead and that campaign didn't present itself as something that was related to trees but was directly as a result of what had happened um there is now um, a working group and a street tree strategy which was developed by sheffield city council and the woodland trust and the wildlife trust and i might not do justice to this um and other bodies who have come together to develop a working a workable strategy for Sheffield Street Trees, the per per perpetuity, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> looking after the ones that we've got and planting some more. Um, and yes, I don't know if that, John, do you think that that pretty much covers it? I think you've navigated a minefield extremely well. You. <laughs> <laughs> <Phew. laughs> I mean, yeah, I think it just goes to be said, I, you know, I think that there was a, one of the things that was, Lots of people felt very powerless people. But what was fascinating, I think, not least, was lots of people did actually, they, you know, they drew upon their different levels of expertise. Um, and in a small part, that was really what the um, the conference in 2019 was about, was just actually bringing together all these people who maybe previously would not have identified themselves as people with a particular interest in trees, but who suddenly had something really important to say about how we understand the politics of it because that was you know what happened in Sheffield was was just that mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> thank you very much yeah very emotive subject but no good uh, good summary um okay there's a few big questions in which are probably going to take a long time to talk about but let's go for one of them from, from David who's asking how can we ensure that social minorities have a voice in tree politics Um, I wonder, well, tree politics, again, is a, a conversation that we were having before about actually what um, what constitutes actually, a, um, at what level can we engage with politics? And I think for that reason, it's why um, Cecil Canine and Dykes, the 330, 300, is a really powerful starting point. Um, you know, if we're not talking about it on a house by house, street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood level and actually talking to people and making sure that um, the trees that are proposed or planted are meaningful for people then it is it's still ine inevitably top down um, so I would say to ensure the widest participation um, it's about 
probably a massive sort of devolution of it and making sure it's as participatory as possible. But um, I'm not sure that I've got the tools, the beams to do that, but I think that's the, that's the utopian idea. Yeah. And of course, a lot of these are bigger issues that go far beyond just street trees, isn't it? It's stuff that really transcends society in mm. general. I, I would say, David, I'm sorry, you've asked this question, Camilla, not me, but I'll just chip in as well. I think um, when we look at sort of tree equity and green equity and a lot of these ideas that are being discussed more widely at the moment, what we've got to be very careful not to do is end up in a place where we just say, well, green equity means let's chuck in more trees into deprived areas because that's not what it's about. It's about ensuring that there's representation amongst the decision makers as well as the people who are being affected by the trees or have the trees near them and making sure that you've got representation throughout the system, not just top down uh, from people deciding to invest in poorer areas because that's just a, a recipe for disaster. So, um, yes, it's more of a, a comprehensive problem than just sometimes what we're being told, I guess. But I should get off my soapbox. No, nobody's come to listen to me. Sorry, Camilla, I'm listening to you. Um, OK, if we're going to do big questions, let's do another one. From Jason, uh, how can we change or shift the attitudes, primarily of politicians, to focus and invest on street trees, especially in times now when we're increasingly cash strapped? I mean, a lot of what you've spoken about, the politics of street trees, some of that comes down to, to money and the fact that there's only a certain amount of money, we're told, uh, and we've got to choose what to spend that on. And street trees don't always get taken that seriously. And how do we sort of tackle that? Have you learned anything from your research on that? Well, I think. I, um, I think one of the most interesting parts was well, uh, there were a number of contributions we weren't actually able to get into the book. I think one, not least actually one, so one uh, with John Burke, who's, who was a Labour councillor in Hackney. Um, but the conversations that we were having about how how you can how if the minute you recognise trees as a solution multiplier. That they're not just there because they look nice and they're not just there because they cool streets and they're not just there because they improve house prices they and actually the house price thing is actually probably the thing we least need at the moment but that the yeah making a case for street trees to be recognized as something that has extraordinary sort of multiple benefits is what needs to be in in debate and actually I think one of the things my stepfather was involved in planting street trees on a street in Plymouth and I think one of the things that's people are often really taken back to when the, when someone says something like it costs 15,000 pounds to plant a tree when sort of logically it doesn't quite take that much money however it does if you look at all of the embodied costs in terms of the aftercare and the level of professionalism that's actually needed to look after trees in the long term but that that could be more participatory I mean one of the things that's happened in Sheffield has been the creation of the um, organization called Abbeydale Street Trees and they've been they're retrofitting they're planting trees I say retrofitting it all sounds very technical they're planting trees in streets where there weren't trees before and I think that's a really um, I think maybe removing some of the I think maybe making it more participatory, removing the barriers which stop people collaborating um, and delivering the planting of more trees when actually um, having people water them. You know, the, those little signs that say water me is a very simple way of street trees being better looked after and actually allowing people to feel that they are able to invest in them, that they're, that you know, they're their street trees. They're not um, not there for any other reason other than to make their street more lovely. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And, and you use the term solution multiplier and you used it in mm. your presentation and someone asked in the chat, uh, Becky, I uh, said, what is a solution multiplier? Could you just kind of define what that is? What is a solution multiplier? It is just um, something that can solve multiple problems. So like I was saying, you know, we're going to have something like food security so planting trees where we could, which might improve you know on one level maybe just biodiversity and provide more forage for pollinators so lime trees that's actually would have an indirect benefit on food security whereas planting a fruit tree maybe has a more direct effect on food sovereign uh, food security um thinking about 
the shading potential of trees, thinking about how that might relate to issues. We, I mean, we're talking about the impacts of rising gas prices, but if our cities get hotter, cooling them is going to become incredibly expensive. So a tree can cool in a way that something else might do. So if it's, those are just three of the things that it does. So biodiversity, produce and cooling, that's one one solution to three problems. I think that's the definition of a solution multiplier. Perfect, thank you very much. Yeah, we often say trees multifunctional infrastructure. They do loads and loads of stuff. And when, when I was working at TFL, um, so when I worked with there, you say it's the only uh, the only asset we have that increases in value after you install it. Everything else depreciates in value as soon as it goes in. But street trees increase in value over time. So uh, yeah, that makes sense. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm trying to look over here at the chat and over here at the questions. Um, the where have I got? Ah, yes, Kate's asked a question. Uh, you mentioned in your introduction about the requirement for landowners in the Netherlands to plant trees by the road. Uh, Kate's asking what you think of the politics and feasibility of a similar rule being applied today. Well, I think one of the things that obviously is interesting about the Netherlands in that period is that it was one of politically, it's it's very distinct in that the there was a huge influx of wealth as a result of international trade, and they were able to, in part, there was the uh, creation of the polders, so the um, reclamation of land. And it had very interesting political consequences on the Netherlands. So actually as a society, it is much more equal. Like the, the distribution of land is much more equal than it is here. Um, and so as a, what's interesting as, as, a, as a policy that could be implemented now, it's probably best directed at you know, house builders. So in the UK, for example, if we have new housing developments, to what extent is a requirement for a meaningful and robust, sustainable tree canopy a part of that? So every, you know, there being, a, and I know there are targets, but to what degree could that be given teeth in the same way as the food track had? Um, and I think, you know, it's one of those things that the, the difference between people having the choice like I've, I think I've got a very I've got a little front garden I, I can proudly say that it has technically it has four trees in it <laughs> they're very small but that's me sort of trying to do my bit for our little street and actually I think that you know making trees more available actually is one thing you know my, many people might not think that they've got the the space but actually that was one of the things I found most one of the most intriguing of all the correspondence in Sheffield around the First World War or during and after, there was one, one gentleman writing to the Sheffield Telegraph saying that people could just plant, if people coordinated in their front gardens, they could create beautiful avenues of trees. They wouldn't need to be planted in the street. They could just plant them in their gardens. It's no, yeah. So I think that the difference again between those kind of top down and bottom up approaches, I think is what's interestingly nuanced. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Chris has asked whether, you know, uh, it was the memorial tree planting uh, linked to World War One in Sheffield. Do you know if that happened elsewhere in the UK? Are there are other examples of avenues of street trees being dedicated to the fallen. Oh, yes, I'm absolutely sure that there was. I mean, I was in the context of my research is not something I've gone into in depth, but I mean, it's it was very much one of the one of the quite interesting things I was reading at the time. Um, something about the Arnold Arboretum in the States where a huge number, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a powerful instinct when you lose someone to plant the tree and have something um, as a form of memorial, or, you know, something there, a tangible thing more than a memorial to, to visit, to see grow and thrive. Um, but that they present, it's very interesting, the kind of the debates that were going on even then about, species selection and you know the expectations that you know if you're starting to plant trees will they actually survive you know the the responsibility of the people who are managing and implementing those sort of wishes to actually make sure that what they plant live it outlive the people who planted it because that's that's the sole yeah pretty much the sole objective um but yeah i've it's something i'd like to do some more research into um and a trees 
trees and memorials. So the kind of relationship between the two and then trees as memorials. So the, dif the difference between the relationship and then the sort of projection onto that, onto the actual trees themselves. Interesting stuff. It's a it's a rabbit warren when you start looking into the stuff and that you just uh, go off into various directions mm. of little bits of interest and take up years of research. <laughs> yeah, well, something to do. Absolutely, yeah, keeps you busy. Um, I'm just scanning through the chat there, but uh, what was I going to ask on the questions? Uh, Corey has asked, after writing this book, do you think that people are contributing to this book? I know you keep saying you didn't write the whole thing. Sorry, I'm giving you too much credit. Uh, after contributing to this book, editing this book, do you think that people can be convinced to conserve urban trees? And do you think that talking about all the benefits of trees actually works to convince people? Has this sort of rewording the question slightly for my own purposes, has it made you feel more hopeful working on this book or, 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 or less hopeful? I would say more hopeful. Yeah, it's got to be more hopeful. Um, I think that the, I mean, one of the things that I find, um, I think one of my interests really quite broadly is just what motivates people. Um, and I think in, in times of, you know, I think not to be sounding too pessimistic, but, you know, I think we're, you know, the challenging times ahead of a number of, on a number of different counts, but um, the act of planting a tree is one that is inherently hopeful. And I think the, importance of protecting trees is even more so I think that's a you know the work that arborists do is incredibly important in perpetuating the lives of trees and I think that that hopefully will motivate and vindicate people who already think it's important and might inspire more people um, so I think it's it's timely and I think not least because we have such a powerful connection with them they're such you know we project so much onto them um that the idea of us not looking after them really we don't as a species we don't look good if we don't look after trees that's my that's maybe my take home point on that so, more that hopeful though that's good <laughs> um OK, well, look, we're almost finished now. I'm, I'm going to really unfairly massively put you on the spot here. It's a question I meant to ask you before we started and I forgot. Uh, so you don't have to answer. But we often ask our speakers about their favourite tree book. And we normally tell them at the beginning of the webinar so they have time to think about it. And obviously you've just you, you could give your book as your favourite book. But I'm just thinking you've obviously researched and read an awful lot and, and you've looked at an awful lot of stuff about this. I'm wondering if any books spring to mind that you think, you know, for people out there who are interested, once they've bought your book and they've read it, what, what text would you really say is a good one to read? Oh, it's a long list. I know. Um, sorry. I'm horrible. Well, okay. The book that changed the way that I see trees is a book called City Trees, which I'm just going to get off the shelf now. Okay. So, mangle it horribly where is it this one henry lawrence it's it's got a clunky title city trees um a historical geography from the renaissance through to the 19th century and i think that is an absolutely fascinating book it looks at the it looks at the impact of three sort of broadly sort of spatial topology so essentially the plantings in the Netherlands the plantings in France and the plantings in England and the impact that they had on the world uh, it, it's it's very it's very very erudite um I'm a big fan of Charles Watkins I'm not sure if you've had him speak so he's a he's an academic at Nottingham and who writes he's written books like um, trees and art and he is they're just very very good for a wonderful kind of overview of the representation of trees and he's yeah, very knowledgeable um and i'm just trying to think i'm gonna go with two more it's, can i have four sure why not yeah absolutely <laughs> i'm gonna go with my um niche one which is that so for a long time i like i, I couldn't claim any relation connection to trees at all so i was you know i worked in I studied illustration, I worked in publishing, I moved to Sheffield to study landscape architecture, but I, I realised 
that actually I'd read a lot, a lot of the novels that I had most enjoyed reading had something to do with trees. And that often that there was something there which had been a compelling part of what has now motivated me. So it's actually going to be five. So there's Barbara King Solver's, um her work um, and the Poisonwood Bible, which starts, it, just, it starts, the introduction of the book is the forest narrating the journey of this family, an American missionary family through, through it, um, which is mesmerizingly beautiful. Um, a very weird book called Mythago Wood, which is a rather niche, sort of British 1970s kind of fantasy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's pretty. Oh, got some interesting things in the chat. And then lastly, it would be rude of me not to mention a book by Richard St. Bob Baker. So I did my PhD on a man who was known as the man of the trees. And so I've read pretty much all of his books, um, most of which are nonfiction, all of which are highly autobiographical and all of which I think are very interesting and compelling for different reasons. Um, But the, oh, yeah, the word for world is forested, also a very good book. Um, Maybe we should have a tree book club. Um, But yeah, so for me, there's one book by Baker, which he wrote in the 1950s, which helped me understand him more than anything else. And it's a book called Kamiti. And it was one of two children's books that he wrote, having returned to Africa after um, a period of about 25 years, having worked in Kenya in the 1920s. And it's it's his environmental philosophy, you know, in a in a very short form, but with a really beautiful articulation of what hope there might be if people concentrated more on peace and productivity than war. And actually at this time, I think there isn't, it's still extraordinarily timely. I think as we face the impact of what will happen with food from Ukraine and Russia in the next few years, you know, militarization isn't gonna feed people. I mean, obviously there's the need, but yeah, for me, that's, yeah, his philosophy in a, in a very nice form. Fantastic. And I said to you before this webinar, I'd like to get you back to do a webinar just about Baker, please, because I think that'd be really interesting. Love it. Yeah, that would be wonderful. And we did do a book. We've done a couple of book clubs. We did one about Franz Vera's work and uh, we, we got a list in the, one of the art mags last year. We published the list of all the books that all of our um, presenters at our webinars have recommended. So uh, we'll have to publish a second follow up list with all the all the books from all the people that they've recommended. Perfect. OK, well, look, Stonehouse Gardening Club is not going to teach itself about trees, is it? No, it's not. And I know that's all of your main priority. So I would like to say, Camilla, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I am going to get hold of the book and read it as soon as possible because uh, there you go. Show it again. One more time. Yes, there we go. Really? Um, so thank you very much, Camilla. Thank you to all of our audience. You're all marvellous, of course. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time for Bats versus Trees. Camilla, go on. Someone said there was a discount code. So what I'll just quickly do, I'll pop, I think, it's, oh, if any, could you, would you be able to email the discount code to the people who attended? Yeah, of course we can. If you... Do you, have you got it? I've got it. Put, if you put it in the chat, then we'll send a copy of the chat to everybody. Brilliant. Okay, I'll do that. Um, oh, no. I got it. Yeah, let me just look it up and I'll, I'll do that. No worries. Talk amongst yourselves, folks. Just wait. It's worth <laughs> it. Just think about what you've heard. Think about what you've learned. Yeah. Now, can you put... No. Um, Christine's Christine's glad she hung on to the end I'm from Yorkshire never miss a bargain so Christine hasn't bought her copy yet waiting until the discount code well no all important I mean it's it's uh, here we go politics of street trees just in case I have a slightly dyslexic moment it's FLA 22 enter that at at, um, there we go FLA 22 and then you get another 20% off and there's already seven pounds off. So it's, it's very good value. 
you can't afford not to buy the book at these it's on a pound a chapter amazing amazing so someone's put that in there um there's links in the chat chris where do you buy it and we'll send the chat to everybody and we'll send all the questions in the chat to camilla as well so you can have a look through what everything's been said so brilliant it's there perfect camilla thank you so much everyone out there thank you sarah thank you for sorting out all the hard bits and we'll see you in a couple of weeks take care stay safe thank you just bye bye bye